Traders Point. How are we doing? Hey. Hey, good to be with you, everyone watching at the campuses, everyone online. So glad that you're with us today as we continue in our series, Letters from My Future Self. And uh, I don't know about you, but I think this one was really personal. Like it hit home last week and, and I have a feeling it's gonna do the same thing here. But I, I think the, just the big idea of this series and, and go with it for a second, um, what would it look like to receive a letter from your future self, right? Some kind of sci-fi type of stuff. But what if you woke up th tomorrow and in your book bag, are sitting on the table was a letter with your handwriting written from you in the future. What warnings, what advice would you need right now in this season that would be helpful, right? So I was thinking about that and, and here's just a letter that I think of my future self would, would write me. So it's, hey buddy, I have this picture in my head that my older self would call me buddy. Uh, he means well, but I, it's the only thing I don't like about him, really. Um, <laughs> he says, hey, buddy, it's me. Um, well, it's you, but, but from the future, you get it. Um, I just wanted to tell you to start paying attention when your dad is fixing stuff around the house. I know you keep saying that you don't need to worry about stuff like that because one day you'll be so rich that you won't have to fix things yourself. <laughs> you'll just pay people to come do it. I'm here to tell you, and man, I wish I wasn't the one, grab a seat, you aren't gonna be rich. <laughs> You'll be rich spiritually. I know you don't know what that means. It's something called Christian humor. <laughs> You'll understand it one day, but you still won't think it's very funny. <laughs> the irony is, you won't pay someone to fix it. Your dad is gonna be the one who comes over to fix everything. Get real friendly with a screwdriver, hammer, and at least a basic working knowledge of electrical and plumbing. You'll thank me later, right? Like I said, that's something that I wish I would have heard and I would have paid attention to. But I think there's a, a letter that I would receive that's maybe a little bit more personal, a little bit more serious, and I think a lot of us could relate. I think if my future self wrote a letter, it would be a short one, and it would just say, Dear Ryan, let that go, let it go. And knowing me, like I think my future self would, I think there would be another letter after that one. Hey buddy, do I have your attention now? I know you don't like that I call you buddy. Let that go. Don't just say you have forgiven them, really, Forgive them. Forgive yourself. Forgive them. Release it. Now, I don't know if it's my personality. I don't know if it's my Midwestern upbringing. But it is very hard for me to admit that you hurt me. I'll often play it off with phrases like, it's good, don't worry about it. Hey, no worries. Look, I got two eyes. You took one of them, right? God gave me two. Get out of here, man. Don't worry about it. And here's, here's what it is. I pretend to be okay to make you feel okay. And at the surface, that might even sound noble, but I can tell you it's not. Because it's drenched in fear. I'm afraid to share how I feel because I'm afraid you'll leave. I'm afraid you will decide that reconciliation is not worth the price and you'll walk away. So I pretend, I stuff it down. I deny what I'm actually feeling. And I don't know about you, but that, that's my struggle. I pretend like there's nothing to forgive in the first place. Maybe for you, your struggle's on the other side of, of not letting go. It's not that you pretend, but you hold grudges. And once someone wrongs you, once they cross that line, they are dead to you. And you burn that bridge and you move on. 
What we want to focus on today, this exercise that we're going to do is just how do we learn to forgive? Really forgive. Not to just pretend like nothing's really going on. Not to just blow up and hold grudges and keep people at a distance. But how do me and you really forgive? And before we jump into what forgiveness is, I just want to take a moment and talk about what forgiveness is not, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So forgiveness is not excusing, right? A lot of times I think we just have this idea of, okay, well, they did this because of this, and we try to justify what happened. That's not what forgiveness is. It's, it's going to reality. This is what happened. It's not denying. It's not pretending. It's not turning a blind eye and say, I didn't see it, or there's nothing there to deal with until it comes out later. You ever been in that situation where you think that you've worked through something in a relationship with someone, and then one day you're like, hey, I, th I thought you were going to be there. I thought you were going to be home at five. What happened? And they're like, well, I thought you were going to be there on the most important, my day, uh, most important day of my life, but you weren't. And it's like, I was just talking about dinner. What do we need to go back to? But we see that love keeps no record of wrong. So it's, it's, it's not denying it, only to bring it up later. And forgiveness is also not immediate trust or reconciliation. I think we have this view too of that if I forgive, that means that everything immediately goes back to the way it was. That trust is reinstated and that even reconciliation is always an option. There may be people that you need to forgive that you can't possibly reconcile even if you want to. Forgiveness hopes for reconciliation, but it's not always guaranteed. And the thing that I would want to say that I think is so important and why this message is critical for us, our lives, and the culture we live in is because I think forgiveness is missing. If you look out into the news, if you look out into what people are talking about, there's this phrase going around. Maybe you've heard it of cancel culture. And I get where it came from. I understand it. Because things were happening for a long time and no one was held accountable. Things were excused away. So finally people said, hey, this is not okay. I'm with you. But the way that it's handled, I'm not okay with. Because it is easy to cancel. It is easy to tear someone down. It is easy to remove them and to throw them in the dark. But I, I think there's a better way. I think Jesus says that there's a better way. Instead of a cancel culture, there could be a forgiveness culture. One where we don't excuse, where we don't deny, that we come and we confront evil and sin and everything that happens. But here's the difference. We offer people a way back, an opportunity to be restored, an opportunity for hope to live. Like that's the kind of culture we want to have. That's the kind of church we want to be. So how do we do that? How do we forgive like that? Even the people that hurt us so badly, is there a way that we could even let that go? And I believe there is. So here's the framework we're gonna be using to what it looks like to forgive. How to forgive. We wanna remember accurately. We wanna respond accordingly. And then release always. So remember accurately. And here's what I mean, not just remembering the account, not just remembering what happened to you and why you are upset with that person. That's probably pretty easy for you to remember. We're gonna remember something that actually happened long before anything that was ever done to us. And from what I've seen, this is the only thing that truly brings the power to forgive, all right? So we're gonna begin with a story Jesus is telling a story here in Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21. So take a look at this. It says, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Now, he's saying this to like get extra credit. He believes that this is an unrealistic number. He believes it's probably like three. But he's going over the top and saying, Well, I don't know, Jesus, what do you think? I think seven. Right? Thinking Jesus would be like, no, no, not that much. So he says this. And he says, no, not seven times. He's like, yep, see, I knew it. But 70 times seven. What he's saying is, 
there's not an amount. There's no line that you're going to get to where you can say, I'm done. I'm done forgiving. How? How could we possibly do that? How could we possibly forgive people that many times? That doesn't seem realistic. Well, it only is in light of the story that Jesus is about to tell here. In verse 23, this is what Jesus says. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold and along with his wife and his children and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and he forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. And he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. And they went to the king and they told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you in the tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. It's a heavy story. It's a heavy story. And it's one that you can't read disjointed, right? You can't just read the second part without reading the first part. Because the reason the second part stands out so much, it's because it's in light of what just happened moments earlier. Because if we just read the second part of the story and there's these two guys walking down the road and one guy owes the other guy a few thousand dollars and he demands his money to be repaid, we're like, that's reasonable. Choking him out on the middle, you know, the side of the road, maybe that was a little too far. But outside of that, a guy owes you money, handle your business. You don't necessarily have to offer him grace. You don't actually have to offer him mercy. Maybe that's okay. But you see, we can't read this story disconnected from the first half. And me and you cannot live disconnected from the first half. Because the truth is, our lives do not begin when someone hurt us. Our lives do not begin when we need to forgive someone. Our lives begin from this place of I am forgiven. Before anything has happened to me, I have been forgiven. I have been forgiven a great debt, one that I could have never paid in my life. One that if I had a million lifetimes, I couldn't have come up with it. But God blessed me. God chose to clear my record. God chose to deal with my sin and extend grace to me. And I'm telling you, from this perspective, this is the beginning of when and how and the power to forgive it comes from. It's not from, I'm just gonna try really hard this year to forgive those that hurt me. I'm gonna try really hard not to hold grudges. It's when we see those that have hurt us in light of what Jesus has already done for us. So when I come to this place, I know I have been forgiven. I know that my debt has been wiped clean. I know that I was dead, but Jesus brought me to life. I know I was an enemy of his, but he adopted me into his family. I know he could have left me alone, but he lavished his grace upon me. I am swimming in grace right now. So when it comes down to it, yes, I can offer you a cup. But we have to bring ourselves to that space of remembering And that will begin to shape how we love and the the links that we'll go to extend that forgiveness. Jesus hinted at this. There was this day where he goes to this religious leader's house and 
the religious leaders are acting kind of funny around him, not really showing him any respect, but there's this woman there, and she's described as a sinful woman. But she comes in and she sits at Jesus' feet. And she starts crying and she uses her hair to wipe the tears from his feet. And she pours this expensive perfume out on him. And these guys are sitting there. They say, if you only knew who she was, you would not let her be that close to you. And look at Jesus' response. He says, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. So once again, when we remember and we start our days from this place, I am forgiven. I needed forgiveness. It completely changes the rest of our exchanges throughout that day. I love the way C.S. Lewis said it. He said, this is what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. We can't disconnect one side of the story from the next. We remember that we are forgiven. That's the first thing. The second thing is we respond accordingly. And I have a feeling with what I'm going to say next might surprise you. Because maybe you thought that this was off limits. This was something that we didn't talk about or touch. And this was always wrong. But I believe it's a word. I believe it's an emotion we need to take back if we are truly going to learn to let it go. And I think it's found in the parable that we just read. So, so go back and look at this. It says, then the angry king sent the man to prison. What kind of a king was he? He's an angry king. An angry king. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe that word is surprising. But what I want us to see and to hear today is that anger is not a problem. Sometimes anger is necessary. Anger is telling us something. Anger is not intrinsically bad, but it is sometimes very hard to wield, but there is this idea of a righteous anger. And I think a lot of times we don't let go because we don't control our anger, right? We don't control our anger because we don't have any experience with it. And just from my seat, Here's my theory why we don't do anger very well. Even in the church, we don't talk about it. Because none of us ever saw it modeled well. When someone got angry, people got hurt. When someone got angry, somebody got choked on the side of the road. When someone got angry, someone got cussed out. When someone got angry, the door got slammed. When someone got angry, the relationship was over. But I think we need to take back that idea of anger Maybe that's rage. Maybe that's something else. But there is this, this biblical anger that I think we need to tap into because it's telling us something. And before we can let it go, we need to know what we're letting go of. I love the way Tim Keller talks about biblical anger. He says, biblical anger is energy aroused in defense of something good and released against something evil. So it's Energy aroused in defense. So what, when I get angry, what is it telling me? What am I trying to defend? The thing that I'm trying to defend, is it good? Is it right? Is it pure? And what's the thing that I'm attacking? And I'm not attacking a person. I'm attacking corruption. I'm attacking the problem in this situation. What is it telling me? You know, I've had a... Um, been confronted with this, of being angry uh, at a very specific time of the day. And it was, it was, it was becoming a pattern that really bothered me and, and upset me. And it's going to be harder to talk about because a few of my kids are in here. But there was a specific time of the day where I would get angry. And it was at bedtime. Not for me. I'm great at bedtime. I'm great. It's one of my favorite times of the day. And as an introverted man, 
my bed is on my mind. By the end of the day, that's where I want to be. And I found myself getting angry and getting short-tempered and getting upset when the kids, not that they didn't do anything wrong, um, but they were being kids. And I should have been able to deal with it in a healthy way, but I would lose my temper. I would get frustrated. Frustrated why? Because they want another drink, the 38th drink of water right now in this moment. I don't understand how they don't pee the bed. Um, <laughs> angry because they want to read another book when we read six. Angry because they want me to stay a little bit longer. What was I defending? Was it good? Was it righteous? No, I was defending convenience. I was defending my want to have something when in reality, the best place I could have been was right in front of them. The best place I could have been was reading another book. The best place I could have been was cuddling just a little bit longer, but my anger stole those moments from me. What's anger stealing from you? Unaddressed, left on its own, anger can spin into a bunch of different things, but, but it, doesn't, it doesn't have to. You know, Jesus got angry. Jesus got angry. Think about that. Jesus healed people angry. Jesus cleansed the temple angry. But at the end of the day, he was always defending something that was good, attacking something that wasn't. And at the end of the day, he was always wanting the best for us. Can the same be said about our anger? And you know, what we're going to do next is we're going to deal with this tension of it's okay to be angry, but there's a very small window in which we can be angry. And God gives us some guidelines of what it looks like to be angry and to protect us from ourselves. Like we said, the option isn't just to not be angry ever or to pretend like we're not upset. Anger tells us something good. But here's the tension. Ephesians 4. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. What? Isn't that like sneezing and keeping your eyes open at the same time? Like, is that even possible? Can you be angry and not sin? Well, it seems to be you can. But then he says, do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So he says, be angry. Get, you are going to see things that make you angry. There's going to be things that build up this righteous justice within you. And it's okay to be angry. But remember, what are you defending and what are you attacking? And then he places another thing there of like, hey, don't let it turn to sin. And here's one of the biggest ways that, that you can implement this week is when you get angry, Deal with it very quickly. That's what he put in here. He says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let the day pass without doing something about it. Because I don't know about you, but usually when something makes you mad, that you get angered, someone has offended you or hurt you, it's not like things get better as time goes on. It's not like the story in your head begins to smooth out. If anything, it gets worse. You start adding things like intention. You start adding in details that maybe were or maybe not there. And I think we need to squash this idea that time heals all wounds. Here's another equation for you. Time plus wound equals infection. <laughs> you are offended. You are hurt. Someone broke trust. Someone lied to you. Someone stole something from you. Someone hurt you. You have an open wound. And if it's not addressed, that infection will spread, just like any wound. But this infection, this particular one, what we're worried about is a root of bitterness coming up. Where that anger maybe was righteous in the beginning, but now bitterness has taken over, and I no longer want the best for you. I want you to hurt like I hurt. 
I want revenge. I want payback. I want to see you fall on your face. I want to get even. That's the other side of anger that we have to worry about. So, so that that doesn't stew, so that that doesn't grow, we need to attend to the wound as soon as possible. As soon as possible, we need to attend to the wound. Could be small, could be really big, but don't just shove it down. Don't just pretend like it's not there and to try to move forward. It's telling you something. So when it tells you something, here's the next move. When do I need to go to them? When do I need to go to them? I'm angered, I've been hurt, when do I need to go to them? Because here's the other thing that we have to hold in tension. We also need to have thick skin. We also need to know that we're walking through and we just extend just like a general grace to people that hurt us. Not everything needs to be addressed. Not everything needs to be talked out, right? For example, you leave here today and say you're driving home and someone cuts you off. Don't follow them home. They're gonna start freaking out. You get them all the way to the house and be like, hey, hey, I know what you're thinking. I just wanted you to know that I forgive you. No, no, you cut me off back there. I just wanted you to know. You're gonna need forgiveness from the courts, okay? So don't, not everything needs to be addressed. Not everything needs to be worked out. Some stuff needs to be absorbed and just released. But if, it, if you do need to address it, Here's, here's some good ideas, just a framework of when do I need to have a conversation? When the sin is serious enough to strain the relationship with you or with others, and when there's a pattern of sinful behavior, right? Like I can see this and I can feel it ripping apart our relationship. I can see it and I can see how it's ripping apart your relationships with others. So the loving thing that I'm gonna do is I'm going to go and have a conversation. And when you go, Go to them privately. Don't include other people that have not been involved in this situation. And I'll say this, go to them privately when you can. I know that there's some circumstances right now that the wise thing for you would not to be to go to them privately. It's not meet with them alone. But I'm talking about generally. When something happens, go to them privately. And then here's the other one, go first. I got a feeling there's some people in our rooms today that as we've been going, you're like, I've forgiven them, but I'm not going first. I didn't do anything wrong. I'll be ready when they come. I'll be ready when they come back to me. But the Bible is very clear, whether it's something we did or something that was done to us, that's enough for us to make the first move. Not to wait, because when we wait, whether that's with us, with them, with both, there's a chance for the devil to get his foot in. There's a chance for bitterness to grow. And when that happens, that creates separation, not between just you two, but between them and others and ultimately between them and God. So when I feel a stirring in my spirit, I go first. And then he's gonna continue here in Ephesians of how can we know that we've really let it go? What are some signs that we're not just you know, lip service saying, no, I forgive you. What could we see to know that we've really let it go? Take a look at this. He says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such that is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away with you, from you, along with all the malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So how do I know I haven't let go? How do I know that I'm just pretending. I think you see it up here. Like if I said that I forgive you, but I'm still angry. If I say that I forgive you, but I'm still slandering you. Like, no, no, I forgive you. But if when someone talks to me about you, I'm like, hey, hey, I, I wouldn't. I know some things. About, I'm not going to say everything, but just know I would keep your distance from that one. And then he takes it a step further that, that true forgiveness is not just that I don't hate you. 
It's not just that I'm not enraged and I, and I don't want to hurt you. You can get to this place of kind and tenderhearted. So maybe you've said that, no, I forgive them, but I will never be in the same space as them. I forgive them, but I avoid them at all cost. I would push in on that and say, I think there's still something there that you need to let go of. So remember accurately, respond accordingly, and then release always. Release always. And this is, this is a powerful one. Because I think if we're working through this, the fascinating thing to me is that if you caught it, at the end of that last verse that we read in Ephesians, did he say, did he tell you? Did you see the tie? Why do you forgive them? Why are you kind to them? Why are you tenderhearted to them? Because you forgive them just as Christ our King has forgiven us. Doesn't that sound like the same sentiment from the parable that we read in the beginning? Why should he have forgiven the guy? Because he was already forgiven. Why can we extend forgiveness and be kind to one another, even those that hurt us in inexcusable ways? Because you've been forgiven. So I will say, if you get to that space and you're saying, I still haven't let this go, I will tell you the only place to go is Brian McKnight. Back to one, baby. Back to one. Yes. Remember. Because there's something, there's a disconnect here that's not allowing me to release it fully. I've released parts of it. I've done my best to will it and to say that I forgive, but there's still something there. You got to release it. You, you got to let it go. And like I said, it doesn't mean immediate trust. It doesn't even mean reconciliation. Forgiveness could happen right now, today, in this moment. It doesn't even need the other person. It's in your heart. But I also know in rooms like from where everyone's watching, there's people there going, you don't get it. You don't understand where I'm coming from. You don't know what was done to me. You don't know the pain that I went through. And I can stand here confidently and say, I do not know that I'm sorry for what you went through, that God is not okay with what happened to you. That's not okay, and I'm, and I'm sorry. And what I'm gonna say next, I do not say flippantly, I do, I do not say without compassion, but I say in confidence just the same. That what happened to you, that evil, does not begin to compare to the love that Jesus has for you. What I can say is that holding on to that, it's, it's almost this false sense of power that you get to hold on to but it's hurting you. Forgiveness is not saying that what they did was okay. It's saying that you are not gonna be the one that is punished any longer for it. I've heard it said that, you know, holding on to unforgiveness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. When we release it, we're saying that we are no longer gonna be the ones to punish. We're trusting God with what is going to happen. And I'm going to release that so that it protects me and so that there's no bitterness that can come. And I'm gonna make more and more room for Jesus. And I just wanna give you a few examples of what it looks like in the power that is behind the forgiveness of God. You know, there's this guy, Joseph, uh, in the Old Testament who Heck of a life, right? Born, in, born into a very blended family, same dad, different moms. Some of us know the situation. And some of us all know this situation where we're pretty sure our parents have favorites, right? Like some of the time, at least seasons, like yeah, you definitely love her more or him more. 
There was no surprise. Like everyone knew their parents loved Joe more than the rest of them, right? His brothers didn't really care for this. So they devise a plan. And by plan, I mean, they decide to sell him into slavery, okay? So this is a guy sold into slavery. And as he goes, he becomes a slave to this guy that's well off and he's doing his thing though. He's doing the best that he can in the circumstances that he has and he's getting a little bit more going. He's like, okay, things are starting to look up only until he's falsely accused, crime he doesn't commit, but he's thrown into jail, sold into slavery and then sits in jail year after year after year until finally God uses him that he interprets the Pharaoh's dream. He's released from prison. He's given this very high prominent job to oversee all of Egypt. He's doing very well for himself. And then there comes his brothers. They don't even know it's him. It's been 20 years. They, and they never would have thought that the guy they sold into slavery would be running all of Egypt, but Joseph knows them. Joseph couldn't forget their faces. And they're coming in because there's a famine that's hit the land. And without this food that Egypt has, all of them and all of their family is gonna die. And Joseph's in this place, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna forgive or am I gonna get even? And in this moment, Joseph has this beautiful line. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Not that what happened to you was good, but that no matter the situation, we believe that God can rescue you from it and that there is hope on the other side of it. And the next one I wanna share with you, it's a little bit more recent, um, not 2000 years ago. This was in 1999. There was a group of Christian missionaries, medical missionaries in India serving a leper colony over there. And uh, one day, it's, it's the, the husband, the wife, and their, their two kids. One's 10 and one's 6. And the husband and the boys are out when a mob comes, an anti-Christian mob comes, and they kill the husband and they kill both of the kids. The next day, the news makes its way to the wife. And this is her response. And take that into consideration the next day. It says, Miss Stain shook with grief and for a time moved very slowly as if struggling to part her way through the air. She seemed to be impaled in the middle of a thought, which finally, with a quavering voice, she shared, whoever did this, we will forgive them, she said. That's the good news, that there is forgiveness for every sin through the vessel of Jesus Christ. It's possible. Even the thing, the darkest thing, the thing that you don't want to mention, the thing that you have stuffed down so deep, the thing you pretend didn't happen to you because you don't believe that there's anything good that can come from bringing it up. There is power in the name of Jesus. See, Jesus was the only one who didn't need forgiveness. Jesus was the one that lived this perfect life for me and you. And Jesus, the perfect example of what it looks like to forgive people even when they don't deserve it, especially when they don't deserve it. Because do you remember what Jesus said? Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. And this isn't when he was trying to teach them how to play euchre. <laughs> this is when he was dying on a cross with his last breaths, choking on his own blood. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And in this great sacrifice, through that, because he chose to pay the penalty, because he erased our debt, now me and you have access to the Father. Now me and you are a part of this story where we begin from a place of being forgiven and have been called and commanded to live accordingly. We don't forgive because we're pretending we don't forgive because it's the right thing to do. We forgive because it models the power of Jesus. And because you are forgiven are some of the most healing words that there are people right now in your life that need to hear. And I'm gonna close with this one. I'll read it. 
And it says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, I, I don't have time to unpack this. Theological layers to this, people, all kinds of different things. But what I will say, at its lowest level, it's, it means that your relationship with God and your relationship with others is wrapped up together. That we are one body and it's all connected. We can't say that we want forgiveness. We can't expect to receive forgiveness if we're not extending that same forgiveness outward. It's not gonna make its way through. It's going to make our relationships with others suffer and ultimately our relationship with God suffer. So what I want us to do right now is just to create a moment to reflect. This is a safe place. And, and I know as we've been working through today, as we've been talking about forgiveness, there are people on your mind right now that you're like, I need to forgive them. And in the same thought, you're like, I will never forgive them. What we wanna do right now is just create a space just to go through a guided time of who is it that needs to hear, I forgive you. Who is it that you just need to say it and to get it off of your chest, to release that poison, that bitterness from you, to truly get to the root of it so that you can make more room for love. So we're gonna have this moment of guided prayer and then we're gonna close it with this, with this moment of communion. Back at one. Reminded as to why and how we do have the power and the ability and the calling to forgive those who have hurt us. So just take a moment right now, gather yourself, close your eyes, bow your head. And I'm just gonna lead us through this moment. Go ahead and grab your elements of communion as well. What do you need to let go of? Who do you need to forgive? They may never hear these words, but you need to hear these words. I forgive you. This could be a spouse, an ex-spouse. This could be a parent. This could be a child sibling, a family member, a friend, business partner, coworker, stranger. And here's one. Maybe you've been able to heal every, or you've been able to forgive everyone, but you can't forgive yourself. I just wanna give you this moment right now to release it, to lay it down. To say, I'm not carrying this out of here. Back to one, the power, our why. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. And then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it for this is my body. So take the bread which represents the body of Jesus that was broken as a sacrifice for us.
took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Take the cup of juice, which represents the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, we forgive. We come to you. And God, I know so much probably got stirred up today. And at the same time, I believe so much healing began today. Father, I pray that this is just the beginning. I pray that we go from here and we continue to let that go. We continue to forgive those who have hurt us. That we forgive those as you forgive us. God, give us the courage. God, I pray that this becomes a safe place where people know that they can come in and they can be honest and they can share what was done to them and the pain that they've been through the pain that they put themselves through sometimes. And God, that they would be met with your people and they would be met with hugs and they would be met with an embrace and they would be met with this, you are forgiven. And God, I pray that the better we get at, at looking at you, the better we get at better understanding the beginning of our story and all that you forgave us from, that God, that will begin to shape how and to the lengths to which we are able to forgive. Father, be with us. We love you. It's in your son's perfect name we pray. Amen.